Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's week 10, Southern California's on fire. I appreciate that people probably had to go through some things to get here, but you're in for a treat today. Um, let me review the format quickly. We're gonna talk for about uh, 45 minutes, then we'll have a Q&A, and then at three promptly, we'll retire to the reception that is one floor down to continue the conversation in a less formal way. So uh, I'm introducing to you uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, Assistant Professor at the University of Southern California's Annenberg School of Communication. Previously, she was a professor uh, at the Department of Information Studies at UCLA, where she held appointments also in the departments of African American Studies and Gender Studies. She is co-founder of the Information Ethics and Equity Institute, an accrediting body that uses research to train data and information workers in issues related to social justice and workforce diversity. She is also partner at Stratelligence, a firm that works with organizations to develop strategy based on informatics research in areas that include justice and ethics, labor and management, uh, health and well-being. And as if that weren't enough, uh, in addition to her current book project, Dr. Noble is co-editor of the Intersectional Internet, Race, Sex, and Culture Online, and Emotions, Technology, and Design, Communication of Feelings Through, With, and For Technology. She's written numerous articles about race, gender, and the information professions, among other topics. Um, so I'm especially excited that Dr. Noble could join us this quarter. Uh, she provides a model for scholarship that is technologically sophisticated, politically engaged, and generative in its approach to disciplinarity. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Hi. And thank you, Roderick, for that um, lovely invitation. You all really scored when you got him to come and be part of your <laughs> team here. We miss him in LA, and he was a, a favorite of ours at UCLA, so really um, happy for you to be here. And so pleased to join you this afternoon. Um, and to be competing with um, not just the, uh, the beautiful, sunny, hot winter day, which still is amazing to me after having spent 13 years at the University of Illinois and Illinois, um, to come home and really enjoy my life thoroughly with these days. So thanks for having me. Um, I thought today I would talk a bit about the forthcoming book, Algorithms of Oppression, and uh, and then also maybe leave a little bit of space for us to dialogue. So I'm going to move fairly quickly through some of this, just so that we have enough time to also stay engaged in the conversation. I'm going to set even a timer for myself um, to warn me that we're just about out of time. All right. Um, some of you might be familiar with this. This is a campaign from October 21st of 2013, when um, the United Nations teamed up with um, ad agency Mimak Ogilvy and Mather Dubai, where they um, created this campaign kind of using what they called genuine Google searches. And um, this campaign was designed to bring critical attention to kind of the sexist ways in which women were regarded and kind of um, still denied human rights. Over the mouths of various women of color were the auto suggestions that appeared when um, uh, searches were kind of um, engaged, and they placed those auto suggestions over the, the kind of face of the mouths of these women. So, for example, when they um, started to search, women cannot Google auto populated drive, be bishops, be trusted, speak in church. Women shouldn't have rights, vote, work, box. Women should stay at home, be slaves, be in the kitchen, not speak in church. Women need to be put in their places, know their place, be controlled, be disciplined. Now, what was interesting to me about this campaign when it first appeared is that um, it really characterized, was presented in the way that many people think about um, Google search, and particularly auto-suggestion, which is that it is strictly a matter of what is most popular, and that the kinds of things that we find in search are, um, are strictly a matter of wo what's most popular. The campaign, um, in fact, said the ads are shocking because they show just how far we still have to go to achieve gender equality. They're a wake-up call, and we hope that the message will travel far, noted Kahim Shahibar, who was a copywriter for the campaign, who was kind of quoted in the United Nations website. Now, I found this um, campaign um, interesting because I thought that um, maybe we could spend some time looking at 
campaigns like this and a, a whole host of kind of failures of Google search to talk about um, what other processes might in fact be involved with the kind of information that we find there. And um, quite frankly, what I think is at stake uh, mostly for communities who are already marginalized or disenfranchised and how this might in fact exacerbate that. So um, what I want to just give like a, a you know, I'm not really one to give trigger warnings in my classes, but I'm gonna, I'll give a trigger warning that if you love Google, you're, you're gonna be super mad at me later. Okay, so that's, like, that's, that's your warning. All right, um, here's a, a story you might be fairly familiar with. Here's the Washington Post. This was about a year and a half ago. Um, DeRay McKesson, who's a fairly well-known um, activist on Twitter. Some of you might be familiar with him. He became uh, fairly well known around Ferguson in particular and advocating for Mike Brown online. He really became um, super popular after Beyonce followed him and then he like he spiked in followers. So I just feel compelled to say that if anyone here knows Beyonce and you could get her to follow me, it would like really amplify the work. <laughs> so just, just throwing that out there. All right, so DeRay tweets, if you Google map the N-word house, this is what you'll find, America. And what was happening at that time was that if you did a search on the N-word house or the N-word king, Google maps would take you to the White House. And this was during the presidency, obviously, of um, Barack Obama, who some of us still wish was president. Um, okay, so this is an aside. Um, so the, the Washington Post, U.S. News, um, uh, everyone's kind of contacting Google, trying to get a quote from them on how could this happen. And um, this is a very typical kind of Silicon Valley response, or a typical, not just from Google, but from many Silicon Valley companies, which is some inappropriate results are surfacing in Google Maps that should not be. And we apologize for any offense this may have caused. Um, caused. Um, our teams are working to fix this issue quickly. And there's kind of two things going on here. First, we apologize for any offense this may have caused. I know for me that when my husband says something like, you know, I apologize if you're offended, I actually don't feel apologized to. So it's like a weird, interesting non-apology apology, which is something that we often see from um, big corporations in general, which is if there's like one random person in the world who might have been offended by this, then we apologize. Um, as if the whole notion of like taking responsibility for the results, in fact, that their algorithm produced um, would in fact be offensive and we could just really powerfully claim that. But more importantly, I think in their statement that this, um, that our teams are working to fix this issue quickly is really um, kind of a pointed way in which many tech companies um, uh, presume that their, their platforms are working in kind of perfectly and that this is a momentary glitch in a system, right? And so this is a, another way that we often see discourse coming out of um, technologies. Now, tech companies. Um, the work that I do is really kind of situated in using kind of a critical information studies lens. So um, I'm going to talk about that and I'll share with you some of the people who've really influenced um, the work that I'm doing. Um, but one of the things that I think is really important is that we're paying attention to um, how we might be able to recuperate um, and recover from these kinds of practices. So um, rather than thinking of this as just a temporary kind of glitch, in fact, I'm going to show you several um, of these glitches and maybe we might see a pattern. Here we have um, Kabir Ali. Some of you might remember this. Kabir Ali, um, about a year ago, he's, his friends, these are screenshots of a video. He's a young teenager who um, has his friend uh, video him as he does a search for three black teenagers. And when he does a search on three black teenagers, as you can see, almost every single shot is some type of criminalized mugshot type of image of uh, black teenagers. And then he says to his friend, let's see what happens when we change one word. And he changes the word black to white. And then we get some type of strange Getty photography stock images of white teenagers playing multiple sports apparently at one time that kind of don't go together. Um, and this is like the kind of the idealized way in which white teenagers are portrayed. And so this story also goes viral quickly. Jessica Gwynn, in fact, um, who is the tech editor for USA Today, if you want to follow 
kind of good critical reporting of um, the tech sector, I would say um, take a look at what the tech editors at USA Today are doing. Um, she covers this story, as do many others. And, and um, um, instead of issuing an apology a, a after that incident, Google just quietly tweaks the algorithm. And the next day, at Bob's Burgers Guy on Twitter, um, notices that the algorithm has changed. Now, what's interesting are, again, the choices that are made. Google adds in a young white man who's in court who's actually being arraigned on charges of hate crime um, uh, along with kind of keeping. And so this idea that to, to, um, to correct the way, the, the reality or a particular truth, we're going to also add white criminal pictures, again, legitimating that the black criminality was actually legitimate. And then, you know, we throw in like a couple of black girls playing volleyball and like, apparently that's the fix. Okay, so this is again, kind of the quiet response. Here's another failure. Um, Google searches, this is a story that went viral um, when you did uh, uh, image searches on unprofessional hairstyles for work you were given exclusively black women with natural hair. So I wore my unprofessional hairstyle for work because that's actually the hairstyle I wear every day um, for you. Um, but then, you know, when you change this to professional hairstyles for um, work, you are given exclusively white women with ponytails and updos. And I often try to explain to my white colleagues that it's the ponytail and the updo that really make you professional and also being white. Um, so, <laughs> All right, so what, is it, what does this mean? I mean, one of the things that I think is really um, helpful is kind of looking to people like Charlton Gillespie. Um, I think he says it perfectly in you know, one of his pieces about the relevance and the importance of algorithms. He says that, you know, that we're now turning to algorithms to identify what we need to know is as momentous as having relied on credentialed experts, the scientific method, common sense, or the word of God. And I'm going to suggest something that, you know, maybe uh, common sense to some of you might seem a little um, provocative for others, which is we have this idea that algorithms or com computerization or automated decision making somehow uh, can do better than human beings can do in our decision making, in our assessment. This is kind of part of the discourse around um, uh, algorithmic decision making or automated decision making um, and these um, practices to me are quite interesting because they rise historically at a moment in the 1960s we start to see a rise of um, deep investment in um, automated decision making, computerization, um, the kind of phenomena uh, that moves to the fore into the 1980s of uh, desktop computing. And this coincides historically at the very moment that women and people of color are legally allowed to participate in management and decision making processes. So I find this interesting that at the moment that we have more democratization of decision making in kind of the highest echelons of government, um, education, um, and industry, we also have the rise of a belief or an ideology that computers can make better decisions than human beings. And I find this to be an interesting kind of tension. Um, and these are the kinds of things that I look at and explore in my work. Uh, so let me just say, um, you know that every academic has to have a slide that has too many words on it, and that's the slide. Okay, so just bear with me for a minute, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do better. Um, but I think it's important, especially for you know grad students in, um, who are in the audience and undergraduates, if you're interested in thinking kind of in an interdisciplinary way about digital technologies. For me, when I was a grad student and I started thinking about black feminism and critical race theory and kind of the information science and technology um, work that I was being exposed to, um, you know, I was often met with like kind of derision. Um, around that. In fact, I remember I was just sharing with some of the grad students earlier today at lunch that when I was, I can remember being in a research lab meeting and um, one of my professors saying something to me like, um, what is black feminism? Who's ever even heard of that? And I was like, pretty much everybody in gender studies and black studies, but I guess they're not, they don't count. Um, but what I found um, at the time when I was thinking about 
racist and sexist bias in algorithms and technology platforms, particularly in Google, um, uh, that was a hard kind of idea to get through. This is like 2010 or so when I kind of first started thinking about and researching this. Um, now, you know, everyone's talking about biased algorithms. But um, it, there was a time when, you know, that just didn't, that like my mother-in-law wasn't talking about it. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it was like, it's like in the headlines now all the time. So I just encourage you to think about, for those of you who are students, um, what are the frameworks that you're pulling in from other places outside of kind of the traditional fields of library and information science or information science, information studies, um, computer science, um, that can help you ask different questions. And that's what I was interested in doing, is at the time, the people who were writing about Google, kind of around 2010, 11, 12, were really thinking kind of about like the economic bias, for example, of Google, and how Google um, prioritizes its own interests or its own investments, for example, over others. And we see this in um, the early work of people like Helen Niesenbaum, who was writing you know, back in 2000 about how search technologies um, hold bias, or Lucas and Trona. Um, but I was interested in the disproportionate harm that might come to racialized and gendered people through these kinds of biases. And again, I think that when we take kind of our own, um, I think of this in like kind of, you know, I was a sociologist, uh, sociology major as an undergrad, and so I was really influenced by people like C. Wright Mills. Um, and thinking about like the private troubles that I had, and might, might those also be public concerns. I was personally troubled by the fact that um, I, I was seeing people who look like me being characterized in a particular way, and uh, people that I cared about who um, were part of the communities that I was a part of, kind of being characterized in a particular way. And then I started to realize that this was more of a public phenomenon, not just a private trouble. Um, so. Here, um, here I'm thinking about things like the social construction of technology. Now, if you're in gender studies or you're in ethnic studies, black studies, Latinx studies, um, American Indian studies, we talk about social constructions of race all the time or social constructions of gender. We really co we're comfortable with those kinds of um, framings about race and gender not being biological, not being natural, not being fixed but in fact being a matter of power relations, kind of historically um, situated, um, fluid, dynamic, things that can change over time in their meaning. And um, so I was very drawn to the kind of the social construction of technology theorists, people like LinkedIn Winner, Arnold Pacey, who are really helping us understand that the technologies that we're engaging with are in fact not flat, they're not neutral, but they're also laden with power. And they are constructions of human beings. And so then what might human beings be putting into the te digital technologies that we're thinking about. Um, the other dimension of my work in, in that it's black feminist and kind of engaging with critical race theory is I was interested in, and I continue to be in the things that I'm thinking about, interested in um, you know, things that are actionable, things that matter to me in the world and that are legible also. So for example, when I say, like, you know, my mother-in-law doesn't know anything about algorithms, but I can talk to her. She knows that messed up things happen to black people. And she can understand that my work is trying to engage there. Do you know what I'm saying? So these are the kinds of things where when we, t we, we think about uh, research that can make a difference in the world, and I think that's important. And so I also use, um, uh, obviously, I'm trying to bolster this field of critical information studies and add, add a voice to that. All right, so why, why Google? Quickly, because Google is a monopoly and they control the search market along with other kinds of markets. Um, Pew did an import, they do a series of kind of studies on search engine use. They've done, uh, they did one in 2005. The last one they did was in 2012. They do these kind of tracking studies on people who use search engines and what they think. And I'm just going to share with you a couple of headlines from their last study. Um, back in 2012, 83% of the market of people who use search engines used Google. More than that, if we look at mobile. Um, so uh, people will often ask me, I'm just telling you, cutting this off now before we get to the Q&A, don't ask me why I don't look at Bing, because nobody's using Bing, okay? So that's why, <laughs> that's, the, that's the easy answer. Study the monopoly leaders, because everyone's trying to replicate what they're doing, um, and so this is why it's important to study that. 
Um, here's what's especially alarming about out of the Pew study. <clears throat> um, they say that um, according to um, these uh, users um, of search engines, they report generally good outcomes and relatively high confidence in the capabilities of search engines. 73% of search engine users say that most or all of the information they find as they use search engines is accurate and trustworthy. 73% say accurate and trustworthy. 66% of search engine users say search engines are a fair and unbiased source of information. All right, so this is interesting to me. Now, we, you know, I've been giving this talk and talking about the book for a while, and, and you know, it's interesting to me to give this kind of post the last presidential election, because now, again, people have a much higher <coughs> sense of like, hey, wait a minute, maybe platforms are doing something that we hadn't thought about before in terms of misinformation or circulating disinformation. Um, I, I think of it also another way, when I'm in a more cynical, pessimistic uh, mood, I might say, you know, nobody cared about these kinds of biases when they were biased against um, women and girls of color, but now everybody cares because it's thrown a presidential election. So, you know, you could think about it the, whatever way you want to. Um, you know, Helen Niesenbaum, I think, tried to forewarn us um, back in 2000, you know, she said that leading search engines really give prominence to the popular, wealthy, and powerful sites. Really, her study was that those with more capital are able to influence what happens kind of in the realm of commercial search. And of course, this comes at an, a, at an expense of others who are less well capitalized. Um, and so I think this is part of what I'm trying to think about in my work. Now, here's the part of the talk where you're gonna feel like you're gonna need to hit the wine bar after this, okay? So just bear with me and we'll get through this part, but I think this is really at the epicenter of the reasons why I care about this topic. Um, when I first started collecting search results in 2009, I was, um, I was looking at kind of 2010, 2009, I was looking at a variety of identities, um, kind of intersectional identities. So I was looking at um, black girls, Latina girls, Asian girls, Asian American, American Indian. I was kind of looking at all kinds of different um, combinations. I looked at boys, I looked at girls, I looked at men, I looked at women. Really not trying to essentialize the identities, but to think in terms of kind of like the common ways in which people are also engaging with um, identities, whether they're their own or other um, identities. And I looked, I used mostly the kind of um, categories that are in the census, because those are the, um, oftentimes the kind of ethnic and racial terms that people get um, socialized around. And when I first started this um, work, um, in 2009, the first hit when you did a keyword search on black girls was um, hotblackpussy.com. I'm going to say pussy a bunch of times right now, and then we're going to move forward. Um, so this was concerning to me. This is with the kind of Google's default settings. Right? I mean, there was nothing particularly special. And so I was engaged with other graduate students. We were collecting searches with kind of different IP addresses off the <laughs> campus network um, uh, with machines that kind of had, had, you know, pretty much the only like digital traces were that it came out of the box and we had to connect to a network. But really, you know, machines that hadn't, didn't have all of our digital traces personally. Although I will say that I collected searches also on my own laptop and I've been writing about and kind of critiquing Google for a minute and I still get messed up results. So this idea that my own traces somehow would influence, I mean, Google's never quite figured out that I don't want to see that yet, um, no matter how many times I write about it or kind of speak about it. Um, you can see here um, by 2011, sugaryblackpussy.com has taken over the, um, the headline, um, followed by Black Girls, um, which is a UK band. Has anyone heard of the Black Girls? I mean, it's like one, okay. Um, it's a UK band of white guys. They call themselves the Black Girls. Um, they're incredible at search engine optimization and terrible at musical, music distribution. Um, so just throwing that out there because no one's ever heard of them except for Judith. Um, okay, so they're number two, followed by two black girls, Love Cock, this is a porn site, followed by another porn site, another kind of gateway chat site to a porn site, followed by the black girls, our UK band, again, their Facebook page, winning in the SEO game. Um, followed by a porn site and then by a blog. 
So I first read about this in 2012. Um, I was really interested in um, this phenomena and um, um, I contacted Bitch Magazine, some of you might be familiar with there. It's like a feminist magazine. It's really popular in the Bay Area where I used to live. And they, they critique kind of popular culture. And they had a special issue out on um, cyber culture. And I, you know, I just, like didn't have the heart to say like nobody's saying cyber culture anymore, but because it was already like out at the CFP. So I just, you know, I wrote to them and I said, you should let me write the story about what's happening in search because um, this, is, this is really important. And they wrote back and they said, this is not a story because everybody knows when you search for girls online, you're going to get porn. And I was like, aren't we the like fem feminist magazine? Don't we want to, we don't want to critique it, talk about it. And they were like, no, this is a non-story. And I was like, you know, it's more complicated than just like what happens specifically to black girls or Latina girls or Asian girls. It's also that um, girls, you know, that women, all these sites are about women, but women are coded as girls. Like this is just kind of a fundamental sexism 101. We could talk about that too. It's not a story, they're not interested. So finally I wrote back, because I'm relentless, and I said, um, this is just a tip for grad students, do that, like stay with it. I wrote to them and I said, um, I'd like you to do a search on women's magazines and just let me know if Bitch Magazine shows up in the first five pages. And then like 10 minutes later, I could just, I was like visualizing <laughs> that somebody got the email and they printed it out and they like walked around the office and they were like, hey, oh my God, maybe there is something here. And then they wrote back and they were like, okay, you can write the story. So I wrote the story and one of the things that I talked about is like, what does it mean that kind of, you know, the, the traditional players, of course, Good Housekeeping, Vogue, Elle, um, you know, the big, well-capitalized mass media magazines were able to dominate and control the word, you know, women. And really, unless you looked for feminist media, Bitch Magazine was not going to be available to you. And of course, what does this mean? The readership of Bitch Magazine is kind of like, you know, older high school um, aged women, you know, kind of into young adults. So what, if, like, this is a prime group of people for whom maybe a concept like feminism would be valuable or interesting, but would be kind of unavailable or inaccessible in the kind of ways that keywords were associated with particular types of media. So this is like kind of one of the first places where I wrote about that and then I wrote um, some academic things and then I wrote a book about it. Um, here we go with Latina and Asian girls. Again, these are all hyper-sexualized kind of um, Asian girls, porn and sex pictures and movies as our first. Going over here to um, Latina girls, you know, we get a, a website that's ma actually match.com, but it, you know, you can see it doesn't have a yellow box around it. It isn't really called out like an ad um, per se, followed by hot Latina girls on Facebook and a whole series of kind of um, sexualized representations of Asian and Latina girls. Now, these ideas about the kind of the hypersexualization of black women and girls, um, uh, women of color, this is not new. This is not kind of a new media phenomena. Um, these are, in fact, old media practices. Um, there's an, a phenomenal resource for you, particularly if you're teaching students who you want to talk about the kind of the history of racist and sexist representations in the media. Um, and in popular culture, the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia is really an amazing kind of online digital collection. It's also a great collection when you're teaching about digital collections and you're thinking about digital libraries. Um, the Jim Crow Museum, you know, really started as a collection of what we would call racist memorabilia um, by a professor at Ferris um, Ferris uh, University and then um, Ferris State and then um, kind of was all digitized. And what's really interesting about this collection um, that gives us a long, you can see, you know, a, a easily a 200 year kind of history of what these kinds of sexualized images uh, does is it also gives us a counter narrative about what they mean. So in the dominant narrative of black women as Jezebels, as sapphires, kind of in these like um, hypersexualized um, stereotypes of black women, these are in inventions that are used particularly when um, the enslavement of African people becomes outlawed in the United States. And there has 
to be kind of a mass justification for the reproduction of the slave labor force. And so part of how that justification comes into existence is by characterizing black women as hypersexual, as people who want to have a lot of babies right, that can be born into enslavement. And so this is something that's really important. These, ex these stereotypes, they don't just come out of thin air, and they're not based in some type of um, nature or natural uh, uh, proclivity of black women. They're actually kind of racist, capitalist, um, sexist stereotypes that are used as part of the kind of economic um, um, subjugation of black people and black women. And you can read there um, um, quite a bit about kind of, you know, um, longer kind of histories of European fascinations with black sexuality um, and otherwise. But this is a highly deeply commodified kind of stereotype. And of course, this is one of the reasons why it's um, still present and prevalent in um, the kinds of uh, uh, information and media scape that we're in, in, engaging with. Um, here's an image search. This is even back as far as 2014. Now, I have to say, you know, 2014, and I'm kind of giving you one of the things that's difficult about um, doing research, as all of you know who study the internet, is at the moment you study a particular phenomenon that, that happens on the internet, it changes. So I like to think in my own work that I'm kind of capturing these artifacts and then trying to talk about what these moments or what these artifacts represent so that we can make sense of them, because it's likely that we'll see them again. Um, here's an image search on black girls, again, kind of consistent with the textual discourses um, in um, commercial search about um, black women. I really thought that in 2014, honestly, that um, Sasha and Malia Obama would show up kind of in the top of, you know, they were like super popular. Um, in 2009, we thought maybe Raven Simone, the last vestiges of her, we know why she's out now. But, you know, by 2009, we kind of thought maybe Raven would still be there. but. She was gone too. Instead, we kind of, again, and the linkages, of course, these images are, are connected to sites that have a lot of hyperlinks, a lot of capital that are, you know, connected kind of in a network of, um, of capitalized and um, well-trafficked kinds of images. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is, uh, as a research question is, how would black women and girls intervene upon this if the framework of kind of property rights ownership and capital, um, you know, those who have the most money to spend, for example, in AdWords, who are willing to pay more to have their kinds of content and images rise to the top, how would black girls ever compete economically or numerically, quite frankly, against that or in that kind of a... a, a um, commercial ecosystem. And again, who gets to control the narrative and the image of black women and girls has always been very important to me. How, how would those images change, change if you search for white girls? Um, white girls are also um, se sexualized. Um, uh, not, I, I think you can see um, when you look over time, kind of the hierarchy of the racial order in the United States in terms of more explicit um, uh, types of images are always more apparent for um, women of color. And this is very consistent with the porn industry. For example, if you study pornography, which, you know, um, you know, proceed with caution, it's a depressing topic, um, quite frankly. But if you read the porn studies, for example, literature, you find that in the porn industry, white women do the, the um, what we would consider like soft, um, uh, less uh, uh, dangerous types of pornography, both at a kind of like an emotional and um, physical type of, um, and the representations of white women in pornography are not nearly as explicit as they start to become then for black women. Black women do the most dangerous types of pornography um, labor in that industry. And, um, and I think you see a mapping of that. One of the things that's also interesting when you search for white girls is that, um, White girls don't characterize themselves as white girls. They're just girls. And so this is also another phenomenon that w the, the, the marking of whiteness is actually a phenomenon that happens by people of color to name whiteness as a project and um, as a distinct distinguishing feature that people many times who are white do not um, uh, embody or take on themselves. All right. So. What else is important about um, Google and, and, and search? Um, I think this is an important study um, 
this was a critique that was written about um, Epstein and Robertson, um, who did a, a great, you know when you show up in Forbes and people are hating on your research that you're probably doing a good job. Okay, so Epstein and Robertson did this um, amazing study in 2013 where they argued that democracy was at risk because search engine results could be manipulated without people knowing it. And they had a controlled, controlled study, and what they found is that if they gave um, voters, uh, if they had, had them do a search on a political candidate and voters saw positive stories about that <coughs> candidate, they signaled they would vote for that person. And in that same controlled study, if um, they showed negative stories about a candidate, people said they would not vote for that person. So. They argued from their study back in 2013 that democracy was at risk because these that search engine rankings, particularly getting to the first page, was um, was an, an incredible problem because, of course, we know from other people's research, like Matthew <coughs> Henman, who wrote an important book called *The Myth of Digital Democracy*, that people uh, who have you know large uh, um, campaign financing chess to draw from are able to make it into kind of the public awareness and they're certainly much more likely to make it um, to the first page of Google search and can be able to control the narrative and the story about their candidates because they have the capital to do so. And they argued in their study that um, unregulated search engines could pose a serious threat to the democratic um, system of government and there certainly have been um, uh, important players in talking about um, regulation of search engines. Now, um, here we have Google's top news link um, for final ele election results. This is the week following the, um, the presidential election, um, which led to, uh, the, the first link was a story that led to um, um, information here that Trump has in fact won the popular vote. So we know that that is an alternative fact, that is not a real fact, that that did not happen, that, that President Trump did not um, win the popular vote, and yet this is the first hit, right, um, f immediately following. And so it's been interesting to me to watch the conversations over the last few months about, um, you know, bias information, some people are calling that fake news, um, uh, and an incredible emphasis on Facebook but not necessarily as much of an emphasis on Google. And I think that um, let's not forget about the incredible import that Google has. And one of the reasons why I'm so interested in them is because they've really come to be in the public imagination um, seen as um, a legitimate, credible, you remember back to the Pew study, fair, accurate site uh, where people expect that the information they find they can trust. And so this, um, again, is something that I think we have to be incredibly cautious about. Um, I'm going to quick, quickly scan over this because I want to get to a more important um, topic um, here before I close out, which is to say that, um, you know, Sergey Brin, one of the co-founders of Google, has been asked many times about um, the manipulation of search results. And here we had a story about, um, you know, white supremacists and Nazis, how they've hijacked particular terms. You might be familiar with this, of course. For many years, they've been able to manipulate and game um, uh, Google around um, the word Jews um, and Jew um, and have that c tightly linked to Holocaust denial and white supremacist um, websites. Um, uh, when Sergey Brin is asked about, um, you know, adjusting the algorithm to kind of prevent the co-optation of different kinds of words um, from um, white supremacists, um, I love his, it's like I almost cannot keep from laughing when I read this. He says that would be bad technology practice. An important part of our values as a company is that we do not edit the search results, Bryn said. What our algorithms produce, whether we like it or not, are the search results. I think people want to know we have unbiased search results. Except, of course, when we're in France and Germany, where it's against the law to traffic in anti-Semitism, and then we fully suppress and curate white supremacist, anti-Semitic content out. So we have kind of these two different narratives that happen for the American U.S. press and then a different narrative that's happening in France and Germany where, quite frankly, many platforms, not just Google, Facebook, um, Tumblr, um, which is Yahoo, Oath, um, 
many of these platforms are struggling with trying to um, manage the, the flow of disinformation. You have um, uh, public officials, particularly in Europe, who are calling for an, an immediate stop to the kinds of disinformation and misinformation that are flowing through these platforms with a recognition that they have an incredible amount of harm that can um, be generated from them. Of course, in the in the in in the EU, particularly in Germany, there's such a heightened awareness about the relationship between um, hate speech and what led to the Holocaust. Um, and so we have different conceptions about freedom of speech than, than exist in other parts of the world. And I think that maybe um, we could learn from other places about that, but that's, a, again, another topic for another day. All right, so the last case I want to give you, and then we'll open up for some conversation. Um, here we have the case of Dylan Stormroof. Now, many of you know um, Dylan Roof was a 21-year-old white nationalist who opened fire on um, unsuspecting African-American um, Christian worshipers at Mother um, Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in 2015, in the summer of 2015. Um, the, I won't go a lot into the backstory, but um, you know this is a site that's not chosen in vain. This has been kind of a site of radical resistance of white supremacy and a struggle, a site for kind of the organizing and struggle for civil rights and human rights and recognition of African American people, black people in the United States. And so, Dylan Roof, um, after the murders, um, within you know immediately, many researchers are turning to the web and trying to make sense of what's happening here. And I wrote kind of a whole chapter in the book about, um, about this phenomenon. Um, within about 24 hours, someone on Twitter found um, Dylan Roof's kind of online diary at the last Rhodesian. And this was the part of his diary that jumped out to me. Um, he says, the event that truly awakened me was a Trayvon Martin case. I kept hearing and seeing his name, and eventually I decided to look him up. I read the Wikipedia article, and right away I was unable to understand what the big deal was. It was obvious that Zimmerman was in the right. But more importantly, this prompted me to type in the words black on white crime into Google, and I've never been the same since that day. The first website I came to was the Council of Conservative Citizens. There were pages upon pages of these brutal black on white murders. I was in disbelief. At this moment, I realized that something was very wrong. How could the news be blowing up the Trayvon Martin case while these hundreds of these black on white murders got ignored? From this point, I researched deeper and deeper what was happening in Europe. I saw that the same things were happening in England and France and in all the other Western European countries. Again, I found myself in disbelief. As an American, we're taught to accept living in the melting pot and black and other minorities have just as much right to be here as we do, so, since we're all immigrants. But Europe is the homeland of white people, and in many ways, the situation is even worse there. From here, I found out about the Jewish problem and other issues facing our race, and I can say today that I am completely racially aware. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that when we, you know, try to replicate some of the the search, the, this search of black on white crime, the Council on Conservative Citizens um, kind of came up again and again. Now, the Council on Conservative Citizens, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, is characterized as vehemently racist. All right, this is a, um, you know, you could think of it as an online equivalent to the White Citizens Council, which was when you were too, when you were as racist as the KKK, but you were, say, maybe a mayor, or a judge or an assembly member. You couldn't really be in the KKK, but you could be in the White Citizens Council. So the Council of Conservative Citizens is like a, is a you know, you were just in, in, a, in, a, in an interest group that cared about conservative values that, and the interests of white communities, but you weren't like a night writer, a terrorist, writing out and lynching people, let's say. Those were kind of the distinctions between a White Citizens Council and, a, and the KKK. Um, the Council of Conservative Citizens, if you look at their site, is really what Jesse Daniels um, calls a cloaked website in her great book, um, um, Cyber Racism. And so um, what you don't get when you do a search on black and white crime is, for example, you don't get any information that tells you that this is a white supremacist red herring, that this is a phrase that's used by white supremacists as an organizing kind of you know, moniker. Um, you also don't get FBI statistics that show you that the majority of um, uh, murders happen within community. So while we're very familiar with a phrase like black on black crime, um, the truth is that most white Americans are killed by other white Americans. So you, I guess we either have to take black on black crime out of our vocabularies or we have to add white on white crime to make sense of these kinds of phenomena. Um, 
you also don't get access to any kind of black studies literature or any scholarly kind of framings of what does this mean and what, are, what do these kind of movements mean, what are, how are they characterized. Um, think back to the way the public talks about um, the, in the Pew study. You think that what you get on the first page is fair and accurate, credible and trustworthy. And here you have Dylan Roof who's engaging with Google and maybe we could argue a similar way. Um, I'll just say that when I was looking for these kinds of stereotypes and trying to make sense of them, our field is not off the hook. I looked for um, black on white crime, in fact, in the UCLA library. This was when I was at UCLA. And you know, it's a challenge because um, if you look for, let's say, racist imagery like this, um, very difficult to find. In fact, when I was looking for it, I was here I am looking for black stereotypes in Art Store, which is our largest kind of digital collection of, of images in the library. Apparently, there are only six black stereotypes available, according to Art Store. Now, we know that's not true. So now I'm trying to think about, well, what's the metadata? What's happening in the way in which ideas are being characterized? I thought, well, librarians, they're youngish. Maybe they say African American instead of black. That must be it. That must be the difference. Except that now we only have 42 results. And in them, we're getting paintings, oils on canvases. Um, here's a picture by Theodore Kaufman, who is a German painter, painting um, kind of post-Civil War. So that's not exactly the kind of stereotype. I'm not even sure if that is a stereotype. Um, so I thought, well, let me look on racism. Again, here's racism. In racism, we have images, screenshots of a really um, phenomenal satirical website that used to be up called Rent a Negro, but is now down because the um, um, Damali Ayo, who was the creator, uh, the artist who created this website right after President Obama was elected, you know, this was like a, a satire about liberal white people who were all like, I voted for Obama because I have black friends, and then, then they had to produce the black friend at a dinner party and couldn't, and so they could go rent a Negro. And so this was like a, a really great, funny, funny website about um, that particular phenomena of kind of liberal white racism. Um, but that work, which is really clearly about anti-racist discourse, is characterized under, or cataloged here under racism. It's just interesting. Now I'm looking and I finally start to find some of this racist memorabilia of, of the United States. And it's characterized, it's kind of, you can find it under the words black history and racism. Now, I find this interesting because some of us, some of my colleagues and I might argue that we could have, if we had been the catalogers, maybe we had would have characterized this as white history. Again, a, a way of, of thinking and interpreting with different lenses about what's happening in this particular phenomenon. Um, black history, just on its own without racism, gives us back to um, good old Thomas Waterman Wood who and his paintings. And so again, we have a lot of work to do. We have this conception that out there in the commercial <coughs> search spaces, it's terrible, or we kind of know, especially in our fields. But I think we have to also interrogate our own information systems and the way in which these kinds of racialized discourses um, are produced, reproduced, and, and go unchallenged. Um, some of the things I think we can do, I think one of the things we have to do is really reject the idea that our field is neutral and that we're simply information brokers. We have an incredible responsibility. You know, I often think, what would it be like if we centered ethnic studies and gender studies at the epicenter of information schools or at the epicenter of computer science programs? I tell my computer science students, for example, who come and take classes with me, which, you know, can you imagine how hard that is for them sometimes? And they say, um, no one in four years has ever talked to me about the, the implications of the work that I'm doing. I haven't really ever thought about these things ever. And I say to them, you can't design technologies for society and you don't know anything about society. I just don't know how that's possible. So what would it mean if we recentered the people rather than centering the technology and thought out from a different lens? Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, uh, and give us a couple of minutes for questions. Thank you. I have a lot of beverages up here because I'm going to be really thirsty right now. <laughs> so tell me. Yes. Hi, again, um, lovely. Um, I had a question in terms of how do you think the best approach is to combat these sort of algorithms? Because I know, like, 
human moderation is one option, but also most of these algorithms are based off of frequency, and if things like pornography are the highest frequency things used on the internet, then how do you combat that in terms of your actual search entities? I anticipated that question, so don't think I'm a weirdo that I just go right to the slide. But <laughs> So I kind of knew, I kind of knew. All right. So in the book, I I try to theorize a little bit around this. Okay. And one of the things that I do is I talk about what would it mean if we had different interfaces. Now, I don't think there is a technical solution to these problems. So I want to say that first. I don't think you can technically mitigate against structural racism and sexism. I think we have to also mitigate at the level of society, but we also have to be mindful if we're in the epicenter of technology design, we should also be thinking about these issues. Okay, so one of the things I do, you know, my parents were artists, um, so the color picker tool is actually like a thing that's always been in my life for a really long time. So I thought about it as a metaphor for search, okay? What would it mean if I put my black girl's box in the red light district of the internet? I know what the deal is, right? This is, an, a, a, again, like it's a counter narrative to ranking as a paradigm. Because here's the thing, the cultural context of ranking is that if you're number one, like they don't make a big foamy finger that's like we're number 1,300,000, like nobody does that. If you're number one, you're number one, that's what matters <coughs> in the cultural context of the United States, for example, or in the West or in lots of places. Um, so we, the first thing I would do is like break out of the ranking orientation because that has a cultural context of meaning. If we start getting into something like this, now we actually have the possibility of knowing that everything that we're indexing is coming from a point of view. This is really hard to do, let me say, by the way. I've been meeting, working with computer scientists um, super hard. We're theorizing and trying to get money to experiment with this. Um, and I'm always open to collaborations around this. Um, but what this does is this gives us an opportunity immediately as a user, we know like, oh, there's many perspectives that might be happening around or contexts within which a query could happen. Also, what if we had to opt in to the racism, the sexism, the homophobia? Because right now, for those of us who are in any kind of marginalized identity, who are bombarded with that kind of content, which is many people, um, as the default, we don't get to unsee it. We don't get to be unaffected by it. So what if people actually had to choose that they wanted that? That also, to me, is a cognitive kind of processing. Rather than making it normative, we actually have to take responsibility for normalizing that in our own lives, in our own personal choices. So this is just one metaphor for what, how we could also reconceptualize the information environment. Again, I, this isn't new, but it's more like um, keeping at the forefront that the, their, that their con context within which we're looking for things always has a particular bias. What, this, what I'm trying to do here is say there will always be a bias. Maybe there's a commercial bias, maybe there's a pornographic, maybe there's an entertainment bias, maybe there's a government kind of non-commercial, maybe we're in the realm of blogs and personal opinion and we know that. That's different than doing a search on black on white crime and thinking that the first thing you get has been vetted by a multinational corporation that you trust with a brand you trust, the Council on Conservative Citizens. That's what I mean by it, okay, yes. Um, so I, I just want to sort of follow up on that a little because I think that notion of the ranking is is kind of an interesting thing in here, right? Because I mean I think people forget, right? Before Google, there were other search engines that often did not have the notion of taking you directly to the thing, yes. but instead had the notion of of showing you the range of stuff. Yes. Um, totally. And 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 the you know on one so one part is the is the list as yes. output. One right. part is the whole notion of the like I feel lucky button. There is one result, and I can take you directly to it. Right. And so it may be that also that one of the um, opportunities here to sort of recast things is recasting what one gets back as deliberately a wide troll and it's like, well, you know, there's 10 things over here and there's 100 things over there and there's 1,000 things over there and, and that's, the sp that's the spread. And so it might be not just the, the input but the output. But the other thing I sort of want to think about a little bit with you is um, how we better give people a sense of the coupling between search 
and result, right? It's not just that there's a world of things out there, but obviously that it's statistically affected by search patterns. That is, these things right. are attempting to respond to what it is that people are people are um, looking for right. one way or another. Yeah, I mean, the visualization dimensions of information to me are so important to the future of making sense of nonsense, too. Um, and, you know, I, I, I could talk for a while with you about this because I think the other dimension of kind of the mathematical formulation, um, that's not present. I mean, that would be f quite fascinating if like you're, you had a loading bar that was showing you a calculation is running um, that, <coughs> that was legible also to say an eighth grader um, maybe was in text and not in, um, you know, kind of a statistical language or uh, because, you know, those are also shortcuts and representations of ideas and yet they're framed, I think, as like a truth, a mathematical truth. Right. And that um, that's also quite difficult to dislodge. I mean, so I think that's happening. I think that the, making those kinds of things visible is really important. Um, dislodging the idea that even that there is a truth that can be pointed to. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, is challenging that I'm always trying to share with my students is that, that they are acculturated to doing a search and believing there is an answer that can be made found in 0 .03 seconds is deeply problematic because we're in a university where we have domains and departments and disciplines who have been battling over ideas and interpretations of an idea for thousands of years. And so now we're, that flies in the face of the actual thing we're doing here in a university. Um, and so acculturating people to the idea that there's instant, uh, like an instant result, that a truth can be known quickly, and of course that it's obscured by some type of formulation that is truthful, right, that's leading them, a statistical process that's leading them to something that's more legitimate than something else. Again, we get, gets us back into these ideas of, you know, who has more voice and more power, more coupling, more visibility online, than others, and this goes back to my black girls who don't have the capital or numbers to ever break through that. It's, it's hard, but these are the questions for sure. I feel like Roderick is looking at me like he's gonna pull the hook, you tell no, me. No, maybe like a couple more. I okay, like okay. More. And then right. how about two more? Two and more, go downstairs okay, and talk formally. okay, here we go. Sorry, and I'll talk to you, we talk over one. Yes. Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation, I really, really uh, appreciated it. Um, so I, I have a question about the racist images button. I know this is that we're not supposed to even focus on the slide, but I think it's really awesome this apparatus that you're suggesting and kind of really exciting. But I was just wondering, with like the idea of a racist images filter, going back to your work on library search engines, I feel like that is, is part of the problem, right? Like, is this idea when machines and algorithms, <coughs> even communities of people trying to find something like racism. We, we get into this sort of push and pull where there are very, 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 almost comically wrong answers. So like, I was wondering what your thoughts on that filter were, because I, I know there must be some deeper thoughts going on there. Yeah, I mean, um, here's where I think about the work of my colleague Sarah Roberts around like content moderator, moderators, and pe that this is a practice, of, like a laborious practice. Who decides what's racist? Um, I was on a panel yesterday with a woman who used to be a content moderator from MySpace back in the day, and she's like, you know, the team was me, she's a black woman, um, a gangbanger, like a Latin king, um, a white supremacist, a woman who was a witch. You know what I'm saying? She's like, that was like the early MySpace content moderation team in Santa Monica, because she's like, and also we were drunk and high because it was so painful looking at the kind of heinous stuff that comes through the web and curating it out of MySpace. So, you know, they're coupled with this obviously has to be a making visible of the labor that is involved in curating taste and making sense 
of like what, where do we bottom out in humanity in terms of what gets onto the platforms that we're engaging with. I mean, there's armies of people um, who are curating all kinds of things out, the most disgusting things you could ever imagine. Um, Roz was saying yesterday, she said I couldn't shake hands with anybody for three years because I couldn't believe what human beings were capable of. All right, so there was a great content moderation conference at UCLA yesterday for the last couple of days. So here you have, you would have to also make the people legible and visible, this type of work visible, because machines cannot do that taste-making work. Um, not yet, and probably not for a very long time. We're nowhere near that. So I think that's also what has to happen is, again, in the rent -a negro that someone who didn't get it thought that was racist. But the, all the black people who saw, would have seen it would have been like, that is he actually hella funny. You see what I'm saying? So those are sensibilities that we can't um, ignore that, are, that can't be automated, that are also kind of political, quite frankly. And um, that certainly has to be part of how we reimagine like, the technologies that we're designing and engaging with. I don't think you can automate them. I think you absolutely have to have um, experts. One of the things I say to the media all the time when they ask me about changing Silicon Valley and the stuff that comes out of it is I say, you know, pair people who have PhDs and graduate degrees in black studies with the engineering team, or PhDs in gender studies, or American studies or something, right? People, humanists and so, so social scientists, because they have, they have different kinds of expertise that might help us nuance some of these ideas and categorize. We don't do that, and this is why it's, a, it's, you know, it's really difficult in our information schools when we don't put these ideas at the center of thinking about curating human information needs. They're way off in the margin right now. Would you be so kind as to answer one more question? Yes, I sit here, yes. Yeah. So, um, like you said, technology can't do really much of the taste making. I mean, they can't really classify, right? Yes. Um, so, the racist, misogynistic, misogynistic content that we see on search engines is pretty much manifestation of the, you know, how the internet society thinks, right? Don't you think they are complicit in perpetuating these stereotypes? Because Google only aggregates what's popular, what's frequent. Yeah, but Google also um, prioritizes what it will make money off of. So there's also a relationship between um, people who pay it through AdWords um, um, in particular to optimize um, and SEO companies who will pay top dollar to have certain types of content circulate more than other types of content. And so this is where, um, you know, to be like, well, Google's like, you know, if Google didn't make any money off of trafficking <coughs> content, we could maybe argue that it's just like, it, like Sergey Brin says, it's just the algorithm producing the algorithm's results, except it makes money off of the things that will be the most titillating, that will go viral, that, will, that people will click on. And it couples ads in direct relationship to its quote unquote or, organic results. So there's no way, I mean, it's making money on both sides of the thin line on the page. So I think that it's like disingenuous to say that Google's not implicated in, um, in the kinds of results that we get. I think there's a lot of research by others, too, that shows that they will always kind of um, propagate what they make money from first. All right, so that's, again, this is where people who love Google like hate me, because I'm just gonna say they're also implicated in it. At a minimum, you know, um, you know to what effect? At who, who, you know, when you talk to uh, people who, when you think about YouTube, you know, the beheadings uh, in Syria out, screened out by content moderators. Blackface, in. Why? Who decides? What are the values? Those are what's at play in terms of it's the way it's implicated and the decisions that they make about um, acceptability, the acceptability of, of racism um, or uh, you know, misrepresentations of certain groups, but not of others. All right, I'm sorry for interrupting the crowd and Dr. Noble, but we should um, thank her and then we should retire for wine downstairs. We were promised wine by Dr. Okay, Noble. Okay, we're promised so wine. Is wine down there? I hope yes. so. Okay.